Hello again, I'm Paul Beckwith. In the last couple of videos, I've discussed the terrestrial biosphere and how the terrestrial biosphere is actually, with the warming and with the feedbacks, it's actually losing its ability to act as a sink for carbon dioxide. And this is a very, very serious factor because, you know, humans think that we can continue to put off action on climate change, you know, that we have time, and there, there's no time. I mean, when the terrestrial biosphere switches to a carbon source from being a carbon sink that it's been up to now, then the CO2 levels are going to skyrocket in the atmosphere, and we're going to lose the agency or the ability to do too much about the problem. Okay, uh, we have to, we have no choice but to resort to um, carbon dioxide removal methods and solar radiation management methods uh, to basically preserve our ability to grow food on this planet and to access uh, water. So we're hanging by a thread, basically. So this is the details um, of the new paper that has come out on the Amazon rainforest and how the rainforest is uh, basically, it's turned the corner and it's no longer a uh, net carbon sink. Okay, the feedbacks with the other greenhouse gases, mostly methane and nitrous oxide, um, mean that the net climate effect of the Amazon is becoming one which doesn't reduce or prevent warming, but actually accelerates warming. So this is the key paper. This is an open access paper. Just Google the name Carbon and Beyond, the Biogeochemistry of Climate in a Rapidly Changing Amazon. And basically, it's no good just considering cycling and storage of carbon. We have to consider the methane, the nitrous oxide, black carbon, BVOCs, aerosols, evapotranspiration, albedo, all of these effects. And we come to the conclusion, this paper concludes that current warming from non-CO2 agents, especially methane and nitrous oxide in the Amazon basin largely offsets and most likely exceeds the climate service provided by atmospheric CO2 uptake. For example, Amazonian trees alone emit 3.5% of all global methane. So just focusing on carbon uptake take and storage is incompatible with genuine efforts to understand and manage the biogeochemistry of climate in a rapidly changing Amazon basin. So here we go. We've got the largest swath of tropical rainforest on the planet. Um, the forest drives a partially self-sustaining regional climate and hydrological system believed to be at increasing risk of sudden collapse. Okay, it recycles water with the the clouds form, the water falls on the trees. Then there's evapotranspiration, new clouds are formed, uh, rain falls on a different part of the, if the wind's going this way, then it falls on the next part, recycled falls, recycled falls, recycled falls. So if you cut it off here, the whole forest can go into drought. So this is the changes from 2001 to 2019. This is the forest loss, is the red shading areas in the last uh, two decades. This, is, this guy here is the fires from 2001 to 2019, the pink shading. You'll see you know, a lot of it is in the southern regions. Then the uh, agricultural and cattle areas down here. A lot of these fires are set intentionally to clear the land and then it's used for agriculture, cattle, soy production, etc. This is the hydropower and reservoirs here. Um, they're planning on doubling the number of dams on rivers in the Amazon. Oil extraction and mining areas are shown here, um, not just in the southern regions, but all through the, the Amazon. Fishing and hunting areas shown here. So all of these effects, all of these human um, social and economic drivers are causing the land, you know, are, are basically um, reducing forest and negatively affecting the forest. And we're approaching this tipping point, okay, where the forest could actually um, just become totally replaced by savanna. 
okay? And the CO2 capture basically uh, is no, no longer occurs, okay? So this is a, a huge tipping point in the overall climate system. This is the annual fluxes of the primary climate forcing agents in the Amazon basin. So we've got this two global warming potentials used, 100 years and 20 years. This is the methane, um, the flux relative to the atmosphere. So positive is causing warming, and this is a, this is a source, and this is a sink here, if, if it's got a negative effect on the pedograms of, um, of CO2 equivalent. So methane, nitrous oxide, black carbon, when you sum them, when you combine them, you get, uh, you know, if you take a longer global warming potential, the effect is average to be lower. If you take a 20 year one, it's much, much higher, of course. And this is CO2, okay? The mean is the gray bar here, and the, the uh, variance is among the different years. And this is when there's wet years. So when there's wet years, there's generally CO2 captured in the Amazon basin. But when there's a dry year, the actual mean is, it, no, it's, the, the Amazon becomes a carbon dioxide source as opposed to a sink. So this wet year was, for example, sorry, the dry year was 2010, was the anomalously dry year. The very next year, 2011, was a very, very wet year. And the fluctuation from one year to the next um, in, the water, in this water um, availability in the Amazon, you know, causes tremendous stress on the trees um, and the whole region. Okay, so the net climate forcing, um, you know, is, is uh, examined here. There's lots of details given here. Um, and then it breaks it down into... Um, into the individual climate forcers. So we've got the CO2 here. Um, and actually these diagrams uh, show it very well. Okay, so this is pre-disturbance. So you've got the trees in the Amazon rainforest. You've got B BVOX released, methane released and captured, CO2 captured from the atmosphere. You get the plants growing and there's some methane released from the trees and the plants and so on. Um, decaying wood and litter both releases and captures methane, releases CO2, um, takes nitrous oxide out of the atmosphere. Animals and invertebrates with their components of gases released. Now you have soil which is exposed to oxygen. This is the upland forest. Okay, about 20% of the Amazon is inundated seasonally, so it's covered with water and it's this condition here. This is 80% of the Amazon is upland forest, so the soils, they can release CO2, uh, nitrous oxide, and BVOCs, capture methane, okay? Uh, but when you have, so there, there, there's oxygen available here. So when there's biological decomposition, microbial decomposition, you get the CO2 produced. Um, now, when, you're, when it's inundated with water, you've got anoxic, conditions, much less oxygen is available. So you get more methane being produced in this case. These are trees like mangroves and things. And then of course there's the floating vegetation and you get nitrous oxide, methane and CO2 dissolved into the water. Um, some of it goes into the sediments. You get bubbling up from the sediments, reducing some of these gases up to the atmosphere. Now, when you disturb the forest, of course, if you burn things, then you release all of these greenhouse gases plus um, black carbon. You know, when you convert the forest into pasture land and you have cattle, then you're releasing lots of methane, okay, less nitrous oxide. Um, when you, with agriculture, okay, you're still, you're still capturing the, C, the CO2 and some methane, but it, at reduced levels, reduced uptakes and you get N2O, nitrous oxide release still. Your, the albedo is generally increased because you're replacing the dark forest with uh, lighter crops, okay? Um, storms, of course, uh, more intense and extreme storms can topple lots of trees, and of course you have the logging and you have reservoirs where you get the greenhouse gases released. 
okay? And uh, these, are the, these are basically the responses of these climate forcing agents. So we've got CO2, nitrous oxide, methane, the, the biogenic volatile organic compounds, black carbon, evapotranspiration, and albedo. And with high con the, the uh, confidence level, the um, associated confidence level is the color. So high confidence, medium conf confidence, low confidence. So for example, fires, we get CO2 and nitrous oxide and methane all going up into the atmosphere. Um, the effect on biogenic, volatile, organic uh, carbon molecules is unknown, okay? It's produced by the trees, but the trees are burning. Does it produce a, huge, uh, a whole lot of it? Um, but then afterwards, there's much less of this produced. A lot of black carbon from the burning. Evapotranspiration goes way down. The albedo, uh, it generally gets uh, darker, okay? It depends on what you replace the forest with. And then this is done for all of these different stressors um, on, on the um, particular basin. And, uh, you know, it breaks it down into the trace gases, nitrous oxide, the, the methane. Okay, those are the two dominant um, factors that are, that are reducing the, um, the net effect of the sink of the Amazon rainforest. Okay, the methane can be produced in the actual vegetation, as we found recently, but also the vegetation, whether it be grasses or trees or dead stumps or whatever, they can act as a conduit for methane, you know, in the soils and in the water table to actually come up like they act as straws and the methane can go through these materials right up into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's uh, how, you know, there's a two effects. It can be produced, the methane can actually be released by the plant itself, or it can just be transported through the plant. And it also can bubble up from the sediments. Okay, um, so there's a whole section on these biogenic VOCs and, uh, you know, the effect, the aerosols and the ozone um, in the basin and the change of albedo the black carbon aerosols and the evapotranspiration, which, uh, which really is a critical driver of local and regional climate, okay, via both the surface cooling and water recycling. Okay, when the water, when you get the transpiration, when you get the water changing phase from a liquid inside the plants to a gas, it, it carries away heat, you know, cools the surface, uh, but it also uh, creates clouds, which would then cycle back to rain, raining in different areas of the rainforest, and then the whole process repeats. So this is why the, one of the main reasons why the whole Amazon could actually just basically collapse. It can tip over into a regime where there's not enough rainfall to support the vast rainforest. Okay, um, so, you know, the, a lot of the stressors are the deforestation and land use change, the Brazilian arc of deforestation along the southern and southeastern edges of the forest, largely a product of soybean cropping and meat production, was the epicenter of deforestation in the Amazon basin. But more recently, there's gold mining, there's uh, hole drilling uh, for oil wells and things, um, or, you know, trying to find sources of oil. Um, there's uh, fires being set by people to clear land for, uh, for soy growing, et cetera, for generating farms. But also we're getting tremendous droughts some years, like in 2010, and there's huge numbers of fires that are burning down lots of the rainforest in those very, very dry years. Agriculture, reservoir construction, hunting, there's all of these different stresses on the basin and severe storms. So there was one storm in a single squall in 2005. It, it blew down 542 plus or minus 121 million trees or equivalent to 23% of mean annual biomass accumulation. So as we get more and more extreme weather events in the basin, we get that uh, stress as well. Anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, we're losing the Amazon. Bye for now.